Hi, it's Alex. Today I want to talk about GMOs, or genetically modified organisms. And I want to talk about a sort of shift that I'm seeing in our culture. Um, when genetic engineering first came on the scene, it seemed like most of the people who are more environmentally minded were a little bit cautious of it, and were often opposed to it. And I'm seeing now, especially among young, scientifically minded people, I'm seeing a lot of pro-GMO sentiment. And I want to talk about something that comes up. I think it's a little bit of a form of indoctrination that I see happening in universities. Which is that people who are advancing the use of GMOs are painting all opposition to them as pseudoscience. Now, there is a lot of pseudoscience out there. People promoting these sort of fear-driven, like, hype about the dangers of GMOs that are focusing on the health effects of eating GMOs. And I haven't ever seen any evidence that eating genetically modified foods is inherently harmful. Now, it could be harmful if you have an organism that is uh, modified to produce a toxin, and it's a toxin that affects humans, that could be bad. But in general, if you're just modifying them in ways that doesn't affect our health, there's nothing inherently harmful about them. But I don't think that that is the main objection to GMOs. At least, it's not the main objection that I have. And I think that people who, who talk about genetically modified organisms as if that is the only objection, they're kind of making a straw man argument. They're saying, hey, look at these sort of pseudoscience people that have this irrational objection to GMOs, and then they solidly refute that, and they don't ever engage with what I see as the real dangers of GMOs. And I want to talk about that now. I see the real dangers of genetic engineering and using GMO crops, the real dangers as being ecological. So the danger is if we introduce genes into a population of plant, and that plant, or animal, escapes into the wild. And I want to go outside, because I want to show you some of these things in our world. Um, yeah, so let's go outside. Hi, so we are outside now, in the grounds of my apartment complex. What I want to talk about here is how the things that people plant intentionally tend to spread out into the environment. So right here we have a shrub. It's called a burning bush. It's a common landscaping shrub. Unfortunately, it is an invasive plant here. Now, right next to my apartment complex, you can kind of see there's a row of trees, and then if you look kind of behind this parking lot, there's some wild areas adjacent to it. This plant here has fruits distributed by birds, and they tend to spread out into the environment. Now, the same thing happens with native plants. So, this is a project that I've planted. These are black-eyed Susans. They're a native wildflower. And they also spread out into the environment. You can see them even here. They're coming up in cracks in the pavement. And I found them coming up quite far from here. They have seeds that are blown away in the wind. Now I am back in a wild area. So this area is adjacent to my apartment building, but things grow wild back here. And this plant here is called garlic mustard. It was brought over as a food plant, and it escaped into the wild and has become one of the most damaging, ecologically damaging, invasive species in North America. Now this is an example of how what we grow for food can escape into the environment. Now we're at a different part of this wild area, and I want to show you this pretty flower, which most people know as Queen Anne's Lace. It is an introduced plant. It's not native here. Here's some making seeds. It's not quite as damaging, though, as garlic mustard. This plant is the same species as carrots, and it got brought over here because people brought carrots over here, and it escaped into the wild. Why is this stuff important? Well, in the case of garlic mustard, it really decreases biodiversity. 
here's an area where I removed the garlic mustard, and look at all these different species of plants. There's over a dozen species in here. Most of them just came up on their own once I removed the garlic mustard. Here is yet another plant. This plant is a mulberry tree, and if you could look at the leaves, this is probably a hybrid of a white mulberry and a red mulberry tree. This tree has become very weedy. This was also brought over, this was actually brought over to try to grow silk worms to grow, uh, produce silk. And it hybridized with the native mulberry, and it's created this sort of super weed. Uh, and it, it's pretty problematic, like it comes up in cracks in the pavement, and it's a pretty aggressive plant. It's a lot more aggressive than either of the species were on their own. I think this highlights what happens when you play with genetics. This was not modern genetic engineering, this was just natural hybridization. But the point is that humans introduced a new plant and were growing it for their own purposes, and it's caused problems in the ecosystem, and problems for humans too. So basically, what we grow in commercial agriculture, or even in small-scale gardening, it can and does escape into the environment. So how does this relate to GMOs? Well, when we genetically engineer plants, we introduce genes from a different species or group of species into another one. And in some cases, people even take genes from an animal and put them in a plant, or, or vice versa. So you can produce these really large changes that would not arise as quickly or as readily if you were just doing selective breeding. And even just selective breeding has produced some very vigorous plants that can escape into the wild. And even not just selective breeding, but just introducing a plant to a new area. It can cause problems. The concerns with the escape of transgenes, they're called, into wild populations is not a theoretical one. It has been documented happening, and it has happened with species that I have seen come up in my garden. So one of the biggest concerns is with canola oil. Canola oil is frequently grown from genetically engineered plants, and the same species that is used to produce canola oil is also a common weed. When it's grown as a weed, it's known as field mustard. Unfortunately, there was none out in the grounds here for me to show you, but somewhere else where I've lived, it was the dominant weed in my garden, and I spent a lot of time pulling it out. When we genetically engineer plants, we often make them more vigorous, more aggressive, more drought tolerant, uh, faster growing. It's just not a great thing if that escapes into the wild, especially if it's something like field mustard, which is already a tough weed to control. Field mustard in particular is problematic to humans because it is also a weed in other forms of agriculture. So someone's growing canola oil, well, maybe the same field later years, or another farmer in a neighboring field is trying to grow some other crop, and that plant is coming up as a weed in their agriculture. And so it has an economic cost, too. Corn is another thing that's really frequently genetically modified. And I was just driving home to my parents yesterday, and I noticed that there was some corn coming up in a ditch on the side of the road. So it's very clear to me that corn also escapes into the wild, propagates in the wild. This is more of an issue in Central America, which is where corn is native to. But the point is, once you get these genes out there, you can't take, take them back. And so for this reason, I'm really skeptical of genetic modification. And we don't have good legislation or regulation on things to prevent this, prevent the escape of the modified genes into wild populations. So basically, I'm not going to be universally anti-GMO, but the reason I'm making this video is I want to say if you are pro-GMO, just stop talking about the issue as if it were one-sided, because it is not. And the health objections, maybe they're all pseudoscience, but the ecological objections, those are based on science, and they are based on potentially catastrophic changes because of the changes that we have seen with non-GMO crops like garlic mustard getting out into the wild and causing cascading changes in ecosystem, collapse of the food web, awful stuff. And 
who knows what happens if we keep doing genetic modification and we're not thinking about the ecological impacts, really bad things could happen. So I want us to start talking about these issues. For now, because GMOs are not guaranteed to be uh, designed in a way that's safe, I like to avoid them whenever possible, and I advocate for others to avoid them. I think if we want to make GMOs safe ecologically, we need to make, take measures so that they cannot escape into wild populations. One of the ways to do this is the so-called terminator seed, where whenever we modify a plant, we make it so that that plant cannot reproduce by seed. And I think it is absolutely critical that we do that kind of thing, because otherwise we could have this catastrophic scenario like we've seen with some of these other plants. Yeah, that's what I have to say. I hope you've learned something, found this interesting, and I hope we can work together to shut down some of this sort of straw man argument that happens when people talk about GMOs. Thank you.